What's happening, YouTube Nation? <laughs> Today I decided I want to vlog this out again. Um, I'm going to be meeting up with a few friends of mine that you saw in the last video, and we are going to go check out the Kurt Cobain documentary, Montage of Heck. Um, I've got my ticket. What? Hot dogs. Thank you. Um, yeah, as soon as I found out about it, before anybody else knew, I bought tickets. And I'm happy about it. As you can see, my... Wah. I don't know if it's kind of nerdy to show up at a movie theater wearing, you know, a t-shirt of the band that you're going to go kind of see. It's like going to a concert with a ready shirt to see the band, like the headlining bands. Like, we all know why you're there. Fuck it. And you can kind of see I'm wearing the same vest and hat is because this is all from Seattle where Kirk Cobain was from. Actually, this sweater vest um, I got right near... Uh, the house where Kurt Cobain was born and raised in, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the vintage shop where he would actually get his clothing as well. I don't know if it's the actual same shop, but it was close enough to his house, close enough to the bridge where he was under, and we went in there and we tried to find something that would make a mark for us uh, for being in Aberdeen, you know, representing Kurt Cobain. So I think he would actually wear something like this. He would. He would. He did. Something like it. Unplugged. Yeah, that's right. He did. A lot of hasn't happened to me, so that's why I haven't really been filming very much. But now that things are starting to pick up, you know, it's nice weather outside and uh, events are going to be coming up. I'm planning to put a, a lot more vlogs and hopefully I will actually come back with my uh, rant videos. And this time, hopefully, it won't be just complaining about stuff. I'll actually be telling you stories. Uh, I feel bad that I haven't done it in a while and I really do miss it. And I will get bring it back. So... Uh, the other project that I'm working on is called Amped, uh, A-M-M-P-E-D. You can follow it on Twitter, you can follow it on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, this will strictly be for concerts that I attend, um, bands that I find really um, amazing. Um, I haven't really done much work on it because I'm still learning how to build websites. So you got to be patient with me, but if you want to check out the Facebook and Twitter, I update them fairly often. Sometimes I won't do it for a day and then the next day I'll have like three or four posts up on there. And it's just not, it's not just Toronto news, it's music in general, uh, music news that I find interesting. Um, and the reason I wanted to come up with it is because I kind of wanted to boycott the whole auto-tune pop music sensation that the same 10 songs on the radio are played over and over again and people are just getting hypnotized by it and thinking that it is good music. You know what? The music is okay every now and then, but I think that you're missing the real art of the music, which is actually performing real music with real instruments instead of just making it a cash grab. And that's what AMP is all about, is to support artists who actually perform their instruments. And I'm talking from every types of music, um, you know, what I feel as they deserve the attention more than um, say Mr. West or a menage, you know, like, yeah, okay, you're getting tiring, something new, please. And hopefully this whole trend of, uh, you know, uh, marketable, um, entertainers, as I like to put them, that artist, the entertainers will kind of like fade away and real music with real musicians will come back. Uh, real musicians with real talents will come back into the mainstream and people will pay attention to that and uh, support your local artists. I mean, it's... I could go into a whole rant about it right now, but this is about the Kurt Cobain film, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm on my way downtown Toronto right now to go check out Montage of Heck. So here we go. Found a Pokemon. Trainer. Where's your bomb, man? <laughs> oh, I think I'm glad to be on camera. Are you? I don't think so. No, I don't think so? Uh-oh. Uh, that's all good. <laughs> so that guy gave me an interesting story. <laughs> I didn't want to film because I didn't know if he was supposed to be on camera, so I did him the favor, and he told me his whole story about him doing a vlog. Anyways, back to downtown. We're under, we do wall burgers, wall burgers.
<laughs> She's camera shy, it's funny, I'll get her, I'll get her, I'll get her. Oh, just finished an epic meal at Wahlburgers. Chantel's still hiding behind me. She don't want to be on film. I don't know why. Maybe I should put out her Instagram name and people can see her. She stays quiet. Wahlburger's over there. I walk over and the bell light box over there. And what? Did you call me a loser? Hi. Where's the loser? I don't see no loser. That guy's a loser. Works on a parking lot. <laughs> I'm not like kidding. I'm the, probably the biggest loser out of the wall. But there's the Bell Night Box. And we're gonna watch this movie. No, I'm not gonna make a copy of it for you. You can wait. Oh, oh my god, traffic, Toronto. Known for it. Ooh, nice color. Ugh. Thank you. No cars coming the other way. <coughs> oh, it's cold. Starbucks. Sign me up at the Starbucks. How about Tim Hortons? Now I want Starbucks. If it ain't Seattle Starbucks, I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> it was worse than Tim Hortons. <laughs> Tim Hortons is amazing. <laughs> Tim Hortons would be like gourmet. That's a gourmet coffee. We literally got like whatever was left over at the bottom. It's true. It was bad. It was terrible. It was terrible. That was like our first. Like it's like, oh my god, we're in Seattle, <laughs> capital of coffee. They're like, this is our first coffee place. Let's go. Walk in. Oh, this is horrible. <laughs> And the girl's like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, you know what? She did give us a warning. <laughs> We're in Seattle, it's in the morning. Yeah, what they call it or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so cold. Okay, we're going inside. No, no, no. Oh, the hell with this? Roll! She's going for us. Waiting in line. You joined the party that's with the fat does. kid in Monaco. It's like, oh, that's what you, I don't know. That's what when you're used to hanging, you can't yeah. get used to it. Yeah, see? You're not used to it. <laughs> when you see Kenny tag you in video, you get scared. But, <laughs> well, at least I do, but I'm always intoxicated. I'm not today. I'm still retarded. <laughs> Sitting in the theater. <laughs> oh, there's even seats up there. Yeah. Where? Balcony. Okay. Oh, how you get up there? Do you think we're allowed? It was an exhausting process. No. Really? They have all these doors. Picture lock. And no. Not really guards. If there's a reserve seat, though, someone's gonna talk. It's available. Probably. I don't know. If it's or it could be media based. Or yeah, yeah. charged media based. Probably, probably bullshit media based. international programmer here is an audience a vast audience you cannot see but they just enjoyed your film they have questions are you ready sure thing okay where are my questions yes it feels so intimate from where I'm sitting is it good I, mean, I feel like I'm just talking to one person on a Skype okay talk give me everything because I want it because I want to talk to you so badly and I miss you I wish you were here really really sorry I can't be there tonight I really, really want to be there, and I apologize profusely. 
uh, to everybody there and to the festival. And I, I, I just hope you, uh, you, 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 I don't know, say enjoyed the film, but um, it was worth your while. I think so. Brett, I just want you to feel our love, too. Or, yeah, our love, right? So, yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll repeat job. your question to him so he can hear it. So, go. Okay, great Wait, job on the film. I'm glad you captured the more comedic moments. Oh, you've got a microphone now. Okay. okay. Magic. Great job on the film. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I think long-term fans will really just appreciate it. I'm glad you captured a lot of the more comedic moments between Kurt and Courtney and Chris, who's hilarious. I was just wondering, I heard that Dave Grohl did record an interview for the movie, but it didn't make the theatrical release. And then I read online that it's not going to be included in the DVD or Blu-ray release. Did the interview go badly? Not at all, man. You know, first of all, Dave Grohl's like way too big to be a DVD extra. You know, that's kind of almost disrespectful. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is... I made the movie I wanted to make, and after, and in that process, I did ask for an interview with Dave, but he wasn't available. He was doing Sonic Highways, and then after I finished the movie, he became available, and uh, you know, this movie was an eight-year undertaking, and put it in there to see Dave was sort of antithetical to the nature of the movie. It was intended to be a really intimate film. And I think the fewer people you can hear from, the more the audience is invited to connect with those people that you have. And these are the most, you know, primal relationships of Kurt's life. His mother, his father, his sister have never been on camera before. Tracy, who almost rarely ever speaks. Um, Chris, I felt, could easily represent Kurt's interest in the band. And if there was going to be one person from Nirvana... It certainly should be Chris, and Courtney's his wife. And there is a purity and a simplicity to that that is almost polluted by having two people or three people or four people. This isn't a film about managers and deals and labels and all that. So I, I don't mean this in a, in a defensive way at all, sir, who asked the question, but did you feel something was missing about Kurt? Did you? Um, I guess maybe only because Kurt did live with Dave for a couple of these years in 1990. They did have a bit of an intimate relationship before Nirvana broke. So I guess I was maybe curious not to make it. Well, you can't to... hit every beat when you're making a movie. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's a long life. And um, I, I just, you know, I felt really good with where we landed, you know. And it, it, to be honest, I try to get Dave in. And um, we went to Sundance with, I didn't have, I, you know, if you guys, if there's any filmmakers in the house, imagine you work on a film, cutting it for a, a year and a half. And it's a really hard, it's a really intimate film. I mean, this really, really was the biggest challenge of my career. And, you know, it's like a house of cards. And then to try to open that up while I'm in the mix and I'm on a mixing stage for 12 hours a day. And then I had to go back to the office and cut Dave. And I did. And I worked at Christmas and Christmas Eve and New Year's Day and New Year's Eve to try to get Dave in. You know, I really wanted to give it my best effort. And then the, we ran out of time and we went to Sundance and the reaction was great. And we went to Berlin and the reaction was great. And I came back and you know what had happened, man? I had missed that heartbeat, man. I couldn't even evaluate it anymore. I was so, it was done. And I was happy with what I had created, participated. The finished product was great, and thanks for the answer. Thank you. I'm sorry to cut you off, but this was the greatest honor of my life to be able to participate in this story, and for the family to have trusted me the way they did, to 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 give me the materials they did, and not ask for a single change is, you know, is unheard of. And I, I, I just have to say that occasionally I was in Seattle, Seattle the other night and this woman got up and like started saying Courtney was in the edit room and all this shit. And I got to say, I am so fucking sick of it, man, because there was no one in the edit room but me and Joe Breshinkovsky. We didn't even get notes from the studio or anything. 
and I, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I just got a little tickled about something. But because I do think sense of authorship is really important in this film. You know, whose agenda is it, and whose story is it, and whose right is it to tell this story? And I will be straight, totally up, man. It's Francis's right. He, she's Kurt's daughter. She's next of kin. And when I met with Frances, she said, listen, I'm not a filmmaker, so you make the film. And I, I was like, look, you want to come hang out in the edit room, you know, whatever. And she was like, no, you make the film. I just want you to keep it honest. You know, that's Kurt's daughter. I mean, that's like, this, you know, that's the spirit of Kurt right there. You know, she didn't know her father. But I definitely believe that her dad would be fucking proud of her to, I'm um, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional here, dude. I don't even know what your question was. <laughs> I, that's all right, but I'm going to take credit for it. Can I tell you? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, man. So sorry. No, no, no. It's, that's, that's cool. Um, I'm emotional because I'm talking to you from L.A. and I'm at the Cinerama Dome where I was just experiencing this film in, like, the most insane Anyway, sorry, man. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to get it out. Uh, I just wanted to know quickly how the animation uh, sequences all came about. What, like, where um, did the idea from that came from? Well, there's two types of animation in the film. And, you know, these guys, like, my name's in front of the film, but these guys are the real, you know, it's, I mean, look, first and foremost, it is Kurt Cobain. Okay? He, he is, this film is all Kurt, and he inspired us and, and, and really drove us to try to do our best job. And I was had the privilege to work with two of, I think, the greatest animators working in this field. Hisko Hustling, Hustling, I don't speak Dutch very well, who did the, um, the sale animation of uh, the renderings of Kurt in the virginity scene in Tracy's apartment. And he did that by hand, 6,000 drawings, 58 oil canvases that were four by six foot. And uh, he does a style similar to rotoscope, but not entirely. The head is a model that's painted. And we storyboarded that stuff for about five months. The audio in there that you're hearing is Kurt. You know, we'd spend, I'd spend several weeks cutting that audio um, before we got it to storyboard phase. And the scene with Tracy's apartment, we spent months cutting that audio because that was called from like, you know, parts of 200 hours of audio. Um, and so those scenes were done by Hisco. And then the, the, all the other 40 minutes, the Kurtz journals were done by Stefan Nadelman, who is an absolutely brilliant visual effects artist who lives in Portland who I have, he's a filmmaker himself and um, won the Special Jury Award at Sundance in two of, 2003 for a movie called Terminal Bar. And, I mean, you know, Kurt is a brilliant artist, and I just was lucky that we had these other brilliant artists who put everything they had to try to rise to that standard. And the, the journal animation, um, we spent... A lot of time, as much as 30 takes on each shot trying to get it right. You know, it was, uh, this film was like, someone, someone said to me, is Kurt the last rock star? And that's just such a ridiculous comment. I can't respond. But he might be, it might be safe to say he's the last analog rock star. And I wanted this film to feel really analog. And if you work in the field, you could, you could probably appreciate this. Stefan's was working from, I was shooting the journals on an animation stand, one page at a time, 90 degrees straight down, one-to-one -one lighting. And then we were able to take that and then adapt it for the cinema because that's what this movie was intended to be, the cinematic adaptation of Kurt's life, an immersive cinematic experience. So it wasn't like, we're just going to show the journal. That's not this film. And... Um, and, you know, we had to evolve the style depending on where we were in the moment. And um, I think Stefan learned to really give, uh, he was annoyed with me because I, I kept going back and forth on, like, tinkering with, like, 0.2% of grain here and there. To, and, um, 
we were still tinkering in his, to the last minute on that stuff. And, um, you know, we were just like, Kurt's work was so visceral. Um, but I, you know, my approach with filmmaking in this type of film is that, you know, you have however big your canvas is and you got to really work it and, and, and make, you know, every frame count. Because everything is is part, of, you know, working towards that goal of creating that experience, and so the my, most minute details of of how the the the, the words come to alive on the screen, and whether they fade out or fade in, or you know, it's all they're like, you know, they're they're all weapons in your arsenal, and they all really help create that experience. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but I'm just jazzed to have worked with these guys. You know, it's really incredible. And I'll say this, you know, when you do animation, you do storyboards and you do character design, and then there's like this huge leap of faith. And, you know, we couldn't afford to do retakes with Hisco. Stefan, we were doing them way too much. But with Hisco, we couldn't afford it. And I remember when we dove into that and, you know, when I saw his first frames back, I mean, for, for a film with our budget, which may seem high for a documentary, but for animation was really minuscule. It was just, it really blew my mind. You know, I'm just proud to be a part of it. Brett, we have time for one more question. You're lucky. That's because Stefan is, uh, I'm telling you, man, well, I don't want to promote him anymore because you guys are going to steal him, but <laughs> his name's Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so I have uh, kind of a two-parter. Um, how, what was your relationship to Nirvana before making this film, and how did Francis find you? Well, I had seen them drunk one night at Hampshire College. They played my cafeteria, but I, can't, I don't remember much. And then I saw them at the Forum on December 30th, 1993. And oddly enough, I don't remember much. I was a casual fan. You know, I would have done this film if it was about a guy named James Smith from Peoria, Illinois. And I mean that in all sincerity. What really turned me on was the art. And the, the idea that Kirk created this oral and visual autobiography of his life. And film is 50% image and 50% sound. And Kirk worked so vividly in both mediums that it was like this opportunity to do something that I don't think I'll ever have that privilege to do again. So my relationship to Nirvana was secondary as I got into this project. This wasn't a fan project, but by the time I finished, I was a hardcore fan for sure. I don't know how one can make a movie on a subject you don't appreciate the very essence or nature of what they do. But um, it was, you know, that I just I felt in many ways I was stitching it together and Kurt had left this amazing, amazing diary of his life, of his experience. And why do we all why are we all so impacted by Kurt? Because he resonates. He was able to communicate something that was so um, universal. But see, he had we had experienced prior to this just in through the music and the, the visual performance of him on stage. But Kurt Cobain did the sound design for the movie you just watched. And Kurt Cobain did the score for the movie you just watched. And he did all of the animation design for the movie you just watched. And he was narrating the movie you just watched. He's the artist. And he's, as Chris says, an artist with a capital A. And I know you guys got to go. And I just want to thank you for indulging me. And... Um, I really hope you have an amazing festival. I'd like to apologize for Charlotte and to the rest of rest of you for not being there. Um, uh, the, our film opened theatrically in LA, New York, and Seattle today, and I had a lot of pressure to be here to help promote it. Um, but I'm happy to report that we broke advanced ticket records in Seattle, New York, yesterday, and uh, sold out the Dome tonight, which is an 800 seat theater. And um, I'm having like a really amazing night, and I really wish I could have been there with you. But thank you so much, and um, I hope to be back there next year. Well, 500 people in Canada um, had a great experience tonight. Thank you so much, Brett. Can I say one more thing? Yes. Yeah, May 4th. The movie will be at Cineplex everywhere in Canada, May 4th. It's a special one, I think. We realize that we. Uh, this is going to sound so 
absolutely terrible. But we had sold foreign to Universal, and we sold um, domestic to HBO. And somehow we thought Canada was wrapped into that. And we had we sold home video to someone else in Canada, and we were like, how are people in Canada going to see the movie in movie theaters? And Cineplex just came up and called us and like said, hey, we'll put it in cinemas all over Canada May 4th. So we are thrilled that the people, you know, if you like this movie, you can tell your friends May 4th, and it's going to be opening theatrically shortly thereafter at the uh, Bloor, I think it's called, in, uh, in Toronto and uh, a couple other cities in Canada. So I'm sorry to be make that shameless plug. I don't really make any money. I just want people to see this movie in a cinema. If they're anything like me, they're going to want to watch it immediately, like right after you get off the screen. Uh, right? I'm going to go downstairs and watch it right now. Thank you so much, Brett, Thank for taking you. out the time to talk to us. Thank you, everyone, for Thank staying. You. Thank you. Remember to vote. What you think of the whole? What would you think of the movie? You were good. I liked it. That's it. I thought it was fantastic. For two hours, so yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic film. Okay, now we're going home. Oh, well, I'm gonna drop her off, then I'm going home. It's cold. I think we should tell the camera a little bit more information. A little bit more information about what? The movie? Honestly, you got another angle of Kurt in the home videos, and you see a lot of Courtney's tits. And uh they're not very nice. Yeah, they're not. Not nice at all. And, uh, yeah. City's great movies. Wow, so much for a 90s chick, you don't remember that. What? Yeah, I know. I just found the corner. Sure, you know. City's great movies. I put the theme song in the background. What? I wish I had Speaker's Corner. I would have Speaker's Corner. Right now. I guess we're just going right on you right now. No, we just want Speaker's Corner. It's gonna get out to more people on the internet than anywhere else, right? Speaker's Corner was only on television. Actually, no, yeah, it was only on television. Did you ever go on it? Nope. I wanted to. I wanted to. But by the time I got the curse to actually go on camera, it's just like, oh, it's gone. What a shame. Listen carefully. Hi. I'm not gonna film him. Yeah, film him. Oh, look, gun. Bang. <laughs> she wants me to kill myself. Fuck, it's cold. It's the end of April. Who'd think it'd be this cold? I'm just wearing this fucking wool sweater. Not even wool. I don't know, what is this? It's a cardigan? Is it a card again? What kind of card? Sorry. Why are you still filming this? I don't know. Oh my god. I need content. Cool. But yeah, that building used to be cool. Used to be. Where I saw Foo Fighters. So That's where there. she saw Foo Fighters. That's where I saw Smashing Pumpkins. That's where I met Deftones. Yep, yep. <laughs>